Hello and welcome to Watchbox. I'm Tim Masso, he's Jack Foster, and welcome to Icons of Time. This is a crossfire forum for the discussion of the great moments, machines, and milestones of the watch industry. Today, we're talking Grubel Forcey. Jack, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of Grubel? Well, boy oh boy. Um, I have trouble pinning down a first thing that comes to mind with Grubel because about six things come to mind at once. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind for me, honestly, is, uh, you know, I think of the tourbillon. Yes. And uh, the tourbillon is almost always described as a complication, but, you know, the interesting thing about the tourbillon is it's not actually a complication in the traditional sense of the word, right? It's a, uh, it's a regulating device, um, like the, uh, like the Remontoir de Galité. So um, I think first of the tourbillon, I think second of the visual impact that the watches have in terms of the size of the cases, finish of the cases, and the complexity on view. And I also, the third thing that I think about is, of course, the quality of the movements, the quality of the movement finishing. So you have this very interesting um, juxtaposition in Grubel 4 z Generally speaking, when you think about a watch brand, you tend to think either of technical excellence or you tend to think of adherence to and uh, exposition of traditional finishing techniques, traditional movement finishing techniques, but it's not all that often that you get both in the same watch. Uh, you know, so if you look at the independent brands, for instance, most of them tend to specialize in one or the other. Um, and even in companies that combine the two, you can generally say, well, what's really on show here is technical innovation, or what's really on show here is movement finishing. Like, you know, Philippe Dufour, nobody would ever accuse a simplicity of being um, a technically complex groundbreaking watch, uh, you know, from a technical perspective, but in terms of a representation of um, the Swiss movement, Swiss French movement finishing idiom at its finest, that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to think of anything that beats that, but with Grubel you kind of get to have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, and it's fascinating because the watches are sort of the synthesis of many years of tradition that came together. Chronologically speaking, Robert Grubel out of France, born in 1960, went to watch school in Morteau, found his way to Switzerland. He was a prototypist with IWC. He helped design the 3770 Grand Comp, which is one of my favorite watches. And by 1992, he's at Audemars Piguet Renault et Papy. Stephen Forsey, the other half of the equation, he's born in 1967 in St. Albans, which is an English town that has a wonderful marine chronometer tradition. Uh, he actually went to watch school in London, later honed his craft at the Woe Step, but he was a restoration specialist at Asprey. Later, again, Renaud et Papy, and the two decided after seven years working for Audemars Piguet that they wanted to strike out on their own. In 1999, they leave, they create Complatime to generate movement designs for the rest of the industry and provide a revenue source, and then 2004, the tourbillon, like you said, but not just any tourbillon. Why was that a breakthrough? Well, their very first... Um you know, I mean, uh, I think watch brands in, in, in some cases without a whole lot of justification and in some cases with significant justification like to um, uh, capitalize and give grand names to their uh, technical development. So with Grubel Forza, we have their so-called horological inventions, right? And uh, the first horological invention was the double turbine on 30 degrees. So the double turbine on 30 degrees was, um, it wasn't the first inclined turbine that anyone had ever made. There was um, an American-born watchmaker named Albert Potter who made inclined turbion movements back in the uh, late 1800s. Um, but uh, as far as I know, nobody had really experimented with the form before that. And part of the reason, that, well, the, the, the big reason for that was because there was no particular reason to. So the turbion, which is something that we get into in, in more detail in the story, was invented by Abraham Louis Breguet, patented in 1801. And it was designed to address a very specific problem which is that a watch will tend to run at a different rate depending on its orientation with respect to the force of gravity. And if uh, you hold a pocket watch with its crown up, it's going to run at a slightly different rate. Crown up, crown, crown left, crown right, crown down. But the biggest differences are between the vertical and the flat positions. So the tourbillon was, was developed for the pocket watch, which is generally speaking either in a vertical position in the pocket or flat on a table when it's not being worn. And Breguet thought to himself, well, I'm going to take all of the time, keep the essential timekeeping components, the balance spring, the, um, the balance itself, and the escapement. I'm going to put them in a rotating cage so that they're never in any single vertical position for more than an instant. And what you get is you get an average rate for all of the vertical positions. And then theoretically, all you have to do is you have to adjust the single rate for the vertical positions to, to match the flat positions, and you should have a perfect timekeeper. Um, but... Uh, the situation changes when you when you have a wristwatch. Uh, 
So a wristwatch does not stay in a, either a more or less perfectly flat position um, or a perfectly uh, vertical position when it's being worn. I mean, it might stay in a flat position if you lay it on your nightstand at night. Um, but it's in a bunch of different positions throughout the day. So does the tourbillon still make sense? Well, it kind of makes sense because you're still getting a single average rate for the vertical positions. But the problem is it's not in a fixed vertical position for more than an instant in any case. So what um, Messrs. Grubel and Forsey thought to themselves was, well, why don't we take the tourbillon, we'll incline it at 30 degrees to the vertical axis, and we will put it inside two cages, an inner cage rotating once per minute and an outer cage rotating once every four minutes. And so why would you want to do that? Why does that make the tourbillon better suited for a wristwatch? So the, the quantum leap for the double tourbillon 30 degrees was that it adapted the tourbillon to a new environment, to a new set of challenges. So the original orientation of the tourbillon was, let's have a single average rate for all of the vertical positions. Let's have it match the flat positions. And then we should have a single, very, very close rate. The idea behind the double tourbillon 30 degrees is related, but it's not exactly the same idea. What the double tourbillon 30 degrees does is uh, it prevents the critical timekeeping components from ever being in any of the positions where positional variations are most extreme in the first place. And as far as I know, that's the first time that it's the first time that anybody had ever tried to do that in a wristwatch. It's a fascinating watch because first, it looks spectacular. Two, it was going to lay down a marker for the industry because that was their first. Uh, but also because, frankly, it worked. And at the 2011 Concours de Chronometrie, it actually won with 915 points out of 1,000. It beat a bunch mm -hmm. of vintage movements that have been designed solely for chronometry trials. And it beat a bunch of modern haute horlogerie watches that were designed primarily for aesthetics. You can find some very impressive tourbillon watches. And the Crédor Fugaku tourbillon is a great example of this, where the artisanship, the artistry, the imagination is through the roof. But even by their own admission, it's going to run minus 10 plus 15 seconds a day. Whereas the rate for the double tourbillon 30 degree under the gun evaluated third party was less than one second plus or minus per 24 hours, which is extraordinary. That's almost on par with some basic quartz watches. So it wasn't just the fact that this was a unique idea about how to make a tourbillon practical in a wristwatch. Outside the bounds of factory hands, it actually produced what so many modern tourbillon watches do not, which is chronometry, results. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. And uh, the, you know, the fact that it performed so well in direct competition with other watches from other, other you know, major manufacturers, watches which had been designed for chronometric excellence, is um, it's, it's important, you know, because uh, nowadays there are an awful lot of watches that illustrate aspects of the pursuit of chronometry, but, they don't, but we don't know if they actually deliver. You know, so you can see watches uh, that are designed to look like marine chronometers or that adopt um, you know, certain kinds of escapements that are associated with greater precision, but do they actually deliver on, um, on, what they're, on what they're showing? And the reason that I use the word illustration is because a lot of the time they don't. And there's something, you know, there's something very pleasant about a watch that illustrates certain aspects of the horological past, but you know, it's kind of like um, many, many years ago, I saw a documentary that uh, talked at one point about the, the Japanese sword. Yes. And which is uh, an object that is uh, aesthetically and spiritually venerated, uh, and a you know, handmade object, uh, something of incredible beauty and purity of form. But uh, I will never forget the person who was narrating the episode said, the number one question always, of course, is, does it work? And um, the commitment to practicality is one of the things that I think makes the double turbine on 30 degrees the most impressive. And the effort that it requires to actually make the design fulfill its promise is enormous. One of the last things that Stephen Forsey said to me at that dinner all those years ago, I, sa I said to him, you know, does, does, it, does it work? You know, does it actually work? Does it really deliver on its promise? And he laughed and said, well, you know, Jack, this was after a lot of wine. He said, you know, uh, it's always an effort to gain more than you lose. And my take up from that was, you know, you have something of, of great beauty, great mechanical beauty and great complexity, but to actually get it to do what it's supposed to do is um, that's where the effort of the, uh, the watchmakers and the designers really all come together. And I think that's one of the reasons that I think that personally, to me, this is one of the most important watches of the last 20 years. And, and it really is something else. It, it started a long and distinguished trend of tourbillon watches at Grubel Forsey. It should be noted that there have been others, and a lot of them are quite fascinating. They would move on in 2008 to 
the, oh, pardon me, in 2007 to the 24 second tourbillon, which was a different proposition, less of an incline, but a higher rate. So cycle the watch through that change in orientation two times a minute. And this was really the birth of the frenetic tourbillon, where we're moving far beyond, you know, the multi-minute tourbillons of antiquity. Now we're talking about the tourbillon as a piece of kinetic sculpture. Right. Still in service of chronometry, but they answered the fundamental question, how do you make it more spectacular after you've already put two tourbillon regulators in one watch? You add speed and energy. Uh, so there were other tourbillon too. In 2009, yet another fundamental innovation to use the nomenclature of the brand. We get four tourbillon regulators and we get a differential to tie the two assemblies together. This was peak 2000s watch. Like, that's the only way to describe it. That truly is the 1959 Cadillac of the 2000s on your wrist. Yes, yes, yes. A quadruple tourbillon and a differential. You, you, ha you have to have a differential. Yeah, of course. You're not, you're not even the in the point? game if you don't have a differential. No. I mean, l let's face it. Four tourbillon regulators, but it's the differential that ties them together, figuratively and literally. Yes, yes. And um, like its predecessors, it was an exploration of... Uh, you, you know, Grubel Force is one of the very few manufacturers where you can use the word reductio ad absurdum and mean it as a compliment. You know, I mean, they were really, they have always been all about taking, uh, from, a, from a technical perspective, yes. they've always been about taking a particular, particular um, concept or rationale or theory about how you can improve chronometry, and they say to themselves, all right, let's just, like, let's see how far we can go with this, you know? And... Uh, I mean, tourbillon wristwatches, there were very few of them made. Uh, in the mid-20th century, there were some observatory tourbillons made by Patek Philippe and some made by Omega. And uh, they, they performed reasonably well, but uh, not to the degree that they were sort of universally adopted in production watches. Um, you know, I mean, you, you didn't suddenly see Omega start to make um, hand-wound uh, tourbillon Seamasters in the 1960s, uh, you know, and, and with, with very good reason, it just wasn't necessary, you know, but with, uh, with, with, with Grubel, you actually had a situation where, you know, the concept of a fast rotating tourbillon, okay, let's take that, isolate it, and see how far we can go with that. The concept of an inclined tourbillon uh, ro rotating through uh, an, uh, an infinite number of uh, permutations over the course of a four-minute period, let's see how far we can go with that, you know, and uh, the fact that they pursued these kind of hard to understand ideas as far as, the, as they did is really, really admirable. And I think that it's also one of the things that was challenging for watch collectors because, you know, uh, it's a truism that, uh, it's tr a truism of selling anything, that it's hard to sell something that you have to explain too much. And, and you actually made this point in an article that you wrote for Quill and Pat a while back. Uh, you said that uh, uh, the Grubel 4Z tur double turbine on 30 degrees was uh, the opposite of a political bumper sticker uh, where um, uh, you use as few words as possible to get your message across. So, um it definitely serves uh, Which I thought purpose. was a great observation. The thing about the Torbion is that Grubel 4C has come back to it. And if you look at their definitive statement in the modern, well, I guess, how, how do you talk about the modern era with a brand that's been around since 2004? But in 2019, they decided to take everything they'd learned as a manufacturer, recreate hand tools, handcraft, original, you know, 18th and 19th century bien facteur. And they did that with the handmade one. And they could have made that anything. They could have used the sonnerie, they could have used the differentials, they could have used the perpetual calendars that they developed in the meantime. But for the most fundamental handmade watch, the two to three piece a year watch, they decided it could only be a tourbillon, sort of bringing the whole brand full circle uh, with their most prestigious and lowest volume product once again being the tourbillon. Yeah, and um, there are a lot of things that we tend to assume about luxury watch, luxury priced watches. Um, which are not necessarily true. So the idea of the handmade watch, you know, I mean, I've seen people comment that, oh, I, I love my Rolex, it's handmade. I love my Grand Seiko, it's handmade. I love my Patek Philippe, it's handmade. I love my Audemars Piguet, it's, it's handmade. And, you know, I mean, the answer is like, kind of, but not really, in a lot of cases, because making a watch by hand is a giant pain in the neck. Um, it involves, I mean, if you really want to make a watch by hand, you're talking about cutting gear teeth by hand on a, a gear cutting machine. You're talking about polishing each tooth of each gear by hand uh, so that the teeth roll smoothly past each other. You're talking about um, finishing all of the movement components by hand. You're talking about finishing all of the functional surfaces by hand. You're talking about cutting them out, not using a CNC machine, but using traditional hand tools. And uh, 
you know, there's a reason that George Daniels, who did make all of his watches by hand, only made 30 odd watches over the course of his entire working life. It's because it takes forever. Um, it's, it's incredibly time consuming. It's an incredibly inefficient way to make watches. And you know, I mean, no fault of the Swiss watch industry and, and also the American watch industry for that, well, and the German watch industry and the Japanese watch industry for moving to industrialization as rapidly as possible. That's the only way you can produce millions of watches a year which run accurately, will be durable and reliable and give satisfaction to the consumer, but that's not what collectors want. And if what, if what a collector really wants is not only a watch that's finished entirely by hand, which is already a great rarity, yes. but they also want a watch that is actually entirely made by hand. That's pretty much the only place that you can get it. And it's very important to keep that in mind because when you're talking four, five, six thousand man hours into one watch, that's how you wind up with two to three of the handmade one each year. And it's sort of emblematic of Grubel 4C, first because it's very expensive, second because it's very rare, third because it's a tourbillon, but fourth because Preserving traditional craft is a major part of their ethos as a company. It's why they have almost one employee per watch made in their factory in La Chaux de Fonds. It's why they've sponsored outfits like the Time Aeon Foundation and the Naissance d'une Montre project to try to teach watchmakers these traditional crafts and then have them in turn spread that knowledge. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. you talk about that whole notion of the Grubel 4C super graphics on their watches, which admittedly is very controversial. But if you want to know why they have a watch like the handmade one in the collection, just read and translate all that verbiage and you'll know exactly why. Yeah, I mean, it's a challenging choice aesthetically perhaps, but I mean, there's there's no gainsaying the amount of pure horological concept, co content that is in that watch. So Tim, you had a chance to, um, I think, handle every major horological invention. Yes. Um, do you have a favorite? I would say of all the Grubel 4C watches I've experienced, the double tourbillon 30 degree is the one that strikes me as the most intriguing, but not the most wearable. I would say if I'm actually going to wear a Grubel 4C watch every day, it's probably going to be the Balancier Contemporain, which is a watch that came out in 2019. And they were probably the last holdouts in the world of 40 millimeter watches. So they finally got a 39.6 millimeter watch. They came out with one in white gold. They came out one with red gold two years later. Both of them are extremely attractive. I would have to say that it would either be, for me, the Vision 24 second, which won the GPHG Eggy in 2015. Yeah, oh, that's a remarkable watch. Super frenetic, reasonably wearable in size, and not so baroque that I would feel self-conscious wearing it. Yeah, That's yeah. probably the one that I would choose because I feel like as much as I like the Balancier Contemporain and as much as I like the double tourbillon 30 degree, those watches are just too ostentatious for me. And I think that somehow Grubel 4C pulled off something with the 24 second vision that just speaks to me. There is a little bit of an irony of a watch that strips down ostentation rather than building up from a base, they build down from a peak. So it would probably be that. There's a salmon dial model that's to die for. So yeah, Jack, do you have a favorite? Because you've seen as many as I have. Uh, I, I guess my favorite is, um, there were two occasions on which Grubel Force actually lent me a watch to wear during a trade show, once at SIHH and once at Basel World, and wearing someone else's $600,000 watch on your wrist that you cannot possibly afford to replace if something happens to it is an interesting experience. And they were fine about it. Stephen was like, I, you know, I, I said, are you sure this is okay? And he said, yeah, we wouldn't have asked you if we didn't want you to enjoy it. Just don't get on the plane with it which is a reasonable ask. Uh, but I, I wore a platinum uh, GMT to Basel World years ago, and you know, it was a showstopper. I don't remember successfully getting through a single meeting with any other brand while wearing it because uh, the minute that watch popped out from under uh, the extremely loose sleeve of my cardigan, um, conversation just stopped. In the, so it was a conversation piece. It was a source of really, really great beauty. And um, one of the things that, one of the many, many things that I love about Grubel Forzi's watches is this kind of microcosmic quality they have. You feel like you're holding a little mechanical universe or a little mechanical city, um, a, a sort of a microcosm of the philosophy of time in three dimensions in the palm of your hand or, or on your wrist. And there's something about, I mean, it's maybe it's childish, but there's something about seeing that little globe, you know, rotating oh, yeah. that is really, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. Here's the thing, Grubel 4C watches are, for want of a better term, toys for adults because they have a wonderful spatial quality to them that's almost like a little, it's like a playpen on your wrist. You've got that spherical titanium globe. You've got insane duplicative tourbillons stacked atop each other. Uh, you have a wonderful quality of finishing that's 
intended to bring out the best in the materials, frosted German silver, polished steel, uh, beveled brass, uh, satinated gold. There's just so many different features that make them feel like the kind of object that would evoke wonder and joy before the obvious luxury watch inquiries of, is it real and what does it cost? The first right. thing people think when they see the watch, people who don't know about watches, is wow, that's cool. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, my sort of last thought on the subject of Grubel Forzi is for all that it requires an enormous amount of, well, I don't know about an enormous, it requires some intellectual effort to get what they were trying to do technically in a lot of their watches. But uh, you don't need that to take pleasure in them, right? You don't need to know what the rationale behind the double turbine on 30 degrees is to look at it and have the visceral reaction of like, wow, that's cool. You know, if you're the sort of person to be genuinely emotionally moved at all by a beautiful mechanism in operation, it's very, very hard to beat. It's interesting that you break down the roles of Grubel and Forsay in the company. Grubel's a little bit older, Forsay's a little bit younger. Grubel's more oriented towards the aesthetics, the design, the way the watches look. Stephen Forsay is also a, more of an engineer. He comes from an engineering family. Robert comes from a watchmaking family. But they're willing to do things that are almost childlike and fabulous because they're fatuous. You've got the art piece one with a micro sculpture. You've got the art piece two, tribute to Robert Filiou and the Fluxus piece. And what's Fluxus? Well, you can Wikipedia it, but basically it's postmodernist art, specifically from the 1960s. And it's super silly to put into a very expensive watch. You look at some of the partnerships they've engaged in over the years and some of the innovations like the Invention Piece 1, which takes a fun and funky orbital display and transposes it onto one of their tourbillon dials. And some of these watches made in only a handful of examples, simply because the people in charge of the brand are having as much fun with it as the customers, and that is incredibly rare in this industry. Yeah, yeah. We were talking before we started shooting about uh, kind of the state of the modern watchmaking landscape. And um, one of the things I think a lot nowadays is how tired I am of looking at a newly introduced watch and thinking to myself, well, that's a great business decision, instead of looking at it and thinking, wow, what a beautiful watch. But, uh, you know, when I look at Grubel, that's what I think. Well, they say beauty is in the eye of the beeholder, but if you're the beeholder, you're going to get stung. This is a whole lot more agreeable. I'm Tim, he's Jack, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.